Thanks so much. I'm, you know, uh, it's worth a shot. So we've just five minutes to go now. Countdown, sort of a countdown clock, I think.
Hello, everybody. You're all very welcome to this online event towards a European care strategy that's being hosted by the EPP group in the European Parliament. I'm Karen Coleman. I'm a journalist and broadcaster, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator of this afternoon's event. And today, the key question we're going to focus on is what can be done to deliver a robust and a future-proofed European care strategy? And as Commissioner Shuiksa starts work in the area, it's time to gauge the temperature on key elements to be addressed in the strategy. So our discussion today will focus on the need to reform and improve the care sector for those who give and receive care for children, older people, those with disabilities and long-term illnesses, as well as their formal and informal carers. We will also discuss the opportunity to harness EU funds to improve care services and infrastructure, as well as the opportunity for citizens to avail of growing care sector jobs while promoting gender equality. So we have four guests joining us today. Francis Fitzgerald is a member of the European Parliament and vice chair of the EPP group in the Parliament and the EPP group coordinator of the Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee. Dennis Rodka is also an MEP and EPP group coordinator of the Employment and Social Affairs Committee in the European Parliament. Colin Shikluna is the head of cabinet of Commissioner Schuitze, who is undertaking the European Commission's work on a European care strategy. And finally, Stessi Igemonas is the executive director of Euro Carers, the European Association working for carers. Um, you're all very welcome. I'm going to bounce around some questions to all of you now. And by the way, for those of you who are joining us online, again, a big welcome to all of you. Please do join in the conversation. We'd love to hear from you as well. What do you think? What are your views? If you have questions to pose to our panelists, please do put them through the comment section on the YouTube uh, that you're watching at the moment. So let's get started. And maybe if I can ask all of you, participating to please keep your responses nice and short so we can get to as many questions and cover as much ground as possible. So um, maybe, Francis Fitzgerald, if I can go to you first. The EPP group has been calling for a European care strategy now since April 2020. It recently published its position paper. What are the main issues highlighted and the initiatives being called for in that paper? Well, good afternoon, Karen, and I'm delighted to be here talking about a care strategy, European care strategy. It's something the EPP group have taken a very strong stance on myself and Dennis and others uh, in the party. I mean, the pandemic has cast... Now, I'm not sorry to interrupt, Francis, but I can't actually hear you. But uh, Colin, you can't hear Francis either. OK, so what we may have a little issue with the microphones in the studio. So what I might do, Colin, is go to you first, and then maybe uh, Christina and the team behind the scenes, maybe you can let me know when the mics in the studios have been sorted. Um, Colin, as I mentioned, the um, Commission has started work on the strategy. Oh, tell me a little bit more about it. When is it likely to be produced, and, and how far-reaching is it going to be in terms of addressing some of the key issues now that need to be addressed? Thank you very much, uh, Karen, and uh, thanks to, um, for the invitation to participate in this uh, in this event. Um, well, the, uh, the the care package, the care strategy, is um, is already on the uh, on the uh, pro commission work program for next year, for 2022. Um, and uh, the idea is that we will adopt it by the third quarter of 2022. Uh, it builds on uh, on the work that started with the green paper on aging, which we uh, which we adopted earlier this year. Um, but as you mentioned, the, uh, the the scope of this of this initiative will be much broader than care for the uh, for the aging and for the aged. But uh, but we will be looking at the care sector in a very broad and a very comprehensive um, way. Um, we we plan to be both ambitious and uh, and realistic. Um, uh, of course, COVID uh, the last two years, the experience we've had with COVID means that the uh, this sector has been hit in a very particular way, and there are many lessons to be learned from that, um, and we will be looking at this very, very carefully. Also, it will be very important to uh, to consult broadly, um, and that's why an, an event like this is, is very uh, useful for us to uh, 
to listen, to uh, to explain, to uh, to share our views on this uh, on this strategy um, as we as we get down to uh, to work on it in the in the coming weeks and months. Okay, okay, and we'll go back to teasing out a little bit more about what you uh, may have in the strategy as well. I believe now the microphones have been sorted in the studios. Francis Fitzgerald, just maybe first of all, can uh, can you say hello to us so that we know that the mics are working? <laughs> well, I, I hope so. Uh, good afternoon, Karen. Yes. Can, can you hear me now? That's great. Well, yes. look, yes. But first of all, uh, great to be having this topic of, of care getting sent to stage like this. It is sent to stage for the EPP group. Um, we've taken a very strong s stance on it. Myself and Dennis and other colleagues have been working on a, a care paper for our group, as you've said. And I was absolutely delighted to hear uh, President von der Leyen say that this is going to be part of the work program. Program. And now to hear Colin, as I say, saying that it's on the, the work program of the Commission. That's fantastic progress. And we were highlighting a number of areas, uh, Karen, in this strategy. First of all, we need data from right across Europe because, you know, care varies enormously. Who does the care? Who's being cared for? And the conditions vary and the attitude of governments varies quite a lot as well. So I think we need comparable data from across Europe. So we get a picture. We got a new lens in, on the care situation during COVID, there's no doubt about that. And I think the awareness about care is much higher, so it's an absolutely opportune time to be doing this. Secondly, you mentioned it yourself, Karen, the whole question of work-life balance. This is central to a care strategy because we know, for example, that women have carried you know, much of the work of caring, whether it's childcare, elder care, care in the home, we're seeing a change situation slowly with more sharing. But if we want to deal with care, we have to look at this issue of who's doing the caring. Is it largely unpaid? How do we pe help people get the skills to move perhaps into employment in this area and have that work-life balance if they are carers? That it's not necessarily always a choice of being a carer out of the workforce or being in the workforce. So I think there's an interesting debate there. Also, um, the use of EU funds, again, you mentioned it, Karen, a lot of money, more money than ever before is going to member states. Now, there are equality criteria that have to be met. So let's look at infrastructure. Let's look at the care systems, the daycare, you know, the, uh, the opportunity to take a break um, from care. What are member states doing? How are they spending this money? Are they meeting their obligations in this area? And also what we should start doing, and I'll conclude on this, is we should start setting targets like the Barcelona targets on childcare. Let's make sure we do that around care. So it's central to our lives, to our families, to our communities. Let's start pulling back the curtain and look at who's actually doing the care and let's see how we can make it better. That's the EPP plan and that's where we want to get to, Karen. Okay, let's uh, move to Euro uh, Carers and Ige, Ige Monas. You are the executive director of Euro Carers. Um, Euro Carers, of course, they're advocates for informal family or unpaid carers. You have a lot of expertise, of course, in long-term care. What do you think is the EU facing in terms of its aging population and the challenges now ahead for the future of caring? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm delighted to be part of this, this conversation. Um, demographic aging in Europe and, and the increased long longevity also in the European continent means a growing prevalence of chronic conditions, a growing demand for care, uh, and as a result, a sustainability and quality challenge for our care systems. When it comes to long-term care per se, the, um, the sector faces structural challenges uh, with, uh, with poor working conditions, with uh, staff shortages, with inadequate skills and, and, and training. Um, so there's a lot that could be done there for sure. Um, but also based on the data at our disposal, what we know is that actually the main providers of all long-term care in Europe are informal carers. So relatives, friends, neighbors who provide um, usually unpaid care outside of a professional context. Um, the value of their contribution, uh, the financial value is so significant, so big, that it's virtually impossible to replace them altogether by care professionals, at least in the foreseeable future. But unfortunately, when they are not adequately supported, uh, these carers face a long list of challenges 
particularly women, of course, in terms of access to good quality employment, full-time employment, in terms of access to education for young carers, in terms of negative uh, health outcomes as a result of their caregiving, um, social exclusion, poverty. So it is a, a, a vicious circle, really. And, uh, and so um, what, you know, our approach is, is that this is unsustainable in the long run, not least because COVID has done nothing but amplify these pre-existing challenges. So we hope that with the strategy, we will indeed rebalance the distribution of caregiving responsibilities in our societies. But again, I want to draw the attention of everyone around the table that it's gonna be extremely difficult to achieve this without recognizing and supporting informal carers in Europe. Okay, and we may well come back to that point and how these carers can actually be properly remunerated for the work they're doing, their incredible work that they're doing. Let me move uh, to you, uh, Dennis Radka. Um, you pointed out that there is the potential for 8 million EU jobs in, in health and social care over the next 10 years. So what needs to be done to ensure those jobs are realized? And, and you know, what, what do you think should be focused on to reform the care sector for the better? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, also a pleasure for me uh, to take part in this uh, discussion and uh, directly to your, uh, to your question. Uh, let me start with a remark that we have a, a huge amount of uh, undocumented work in the, in the care sector. And uh, when we are talking about creating new jobs in the care sector, for me, uh, the, 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 the major point is that we urgently uh, tackle undocumented uh, work in this, uh, in this sector. So we have millions un of undocumented uh, workers uh, in this sector European-wide. Uh, and uh, um, uh, for me, it's important to, to have an uh, uh, um, exchange of, of best practices because in, uh, when you see in, in, in Austria or in Belgium, we have uh, some good approaches in, in, in fighting undocumented work in the, in the care sectors. And so we should uh, um, uh, look uh, closely uh, w w what they are doing uh, better than others and uh, then try to, to implement it on the European uh, level. Because undocumented work means uh, no social protection, no pension, uh, no taxes, uh, no standards in, in working in, in, in security and so on. And uh, this is for me a, a key issue uh, when, when I'm talking about creating 8 million uh, uh, new jobs in, in European uh, care sector. And when you talk about undocumented workers, are they working completely in the private sector? Are they working for individuals in homes? You know, in, who, who are they working for? Uh, well, uh, the, the, uh, both of it, but, but, but of course uh, the, uh, the, the biggest amount you will find in, in, in private households. So uh, it, is, it is very difficult to, uh, to have a, a close look at that because uh, there is uh, happening a lot, a lot uh, in the dark. So uh, uh, um, it's, um, uh, th this makes it uh, much more uh, difficult. But um, for instance, in, in, in Belgium, and Austria, as I said, uh, they are. You, you can find examples uh, um, um, how to to make it attractive, uh, to make uh, it uh, um, uh, documented work. And uh, so we we should uh, should have a, a close look at these uh, systems uh, which are working quite well. Um, okay, and maybe thank you for that, Dennis. If I can go back to you then, uh, Colin. Um, because, of course, the strategy is, is now being worked on and there'll be a lot of development on that over um, the next while. But what kind of proposals is the European Commission likely to ensure a fit-for-purpose care sector? Well, first of all, um, the, uh, we will be coming out with a, with a communication which has two main, main aspects to it. One is a... Uh, um, uh, you know, it will be a care strategy which will con contain a recommendation on long-term care, 
uh, but it will also we'll also use this vehicle um, to to revise the Barcelona targets which are linked to to childcare more more specifically because we wanted to to ensure that there is this comprehensive approach to care especially because there are several factors which are which uh, which are linked across across the board and in particular the uh, the informal aspects which which Dennis was referring to now the the where we we want to focus is on on six areas in particular first of all access to care we want to make sure that those who need it are able to find it um, we need to look at the affordability of care, um, which speaks for itself, uh, the sustainability of care. We need to make sure that the kinds of services that are offered are ones which, uh, which can really be give the service needed to those who need it and in the way that they need it. There is the quality of care, because as we know, uh, even within the European Union itself, there are very large differences in the standard and in the quality of care that is that is on offer. And here again, there are differences between the formal and the informal sectors. Fifth, we need to look at the workforce. You know, who is providing care? Um, again, the uh, the informal versus the formal. We have the um, you know mobility of people, which which is which has a great impact on this. Uh, uh, on the sector where we know that a very large proportion of people who are employed in, in the care sector are people who have moved from one country to another, sometimes one member state to another, but sometimes also coming from outside of the European Union. And then the sixth and, and the final aspect would be the, uh, the, the female labour market participation, because as has been mentioned, um, women are, are very, uh, the proportion of women in the sector is very high. Um, both in the in the formal sense, but also where informal care uh, is concerned, and of course that has an impact on work-life balance. It has an impact on the other areas of the labour market where where women uh, either should be involved um, and don't have the opportunity to be, um, or um, more broadly on the labour force uh, in general. So these will be the the main headlines. In the background, we will have this um, also this theme of intergenerational solidarity and responsibility, because quite clearly, uh, especially in the context of the uh, of of, uh, of aging, it's it's very important that these are issues that uh, the that where the contribution is coming from across the board. This is not only something that concerns the aged or children or the disabled. This is something where the whole of society needs to feel that is it is able to give a contribution. Okay, uh, uh, quite a comprehensive list of, of aims and goals there. Let's, let's take one of the key ones, which has been mentioned now several times. That, that is, of course, that in, in many respects, it's women who are doing the um, most of the caring. And, and, and more often than not, they're not being paid. Their pensions are devastated as a result as well. So if I can go to you, Francis Fitzgerald, because you mentioned this as well. What can be done? to address this, to ensure that those who are caring and, and primarily, as we've been hearing, women are, that they're going to be properly remunerated and that pensions as well, their pensions can be addressed in that. Well, actually, everything that Colin has said there, because if you build a care strategy, you're actually supporting women. Um, you're dealing with these issues. Now, there will always be some informal care, voluntary care. Family members will decide to look after aged parents as, as uh, family members look after young children. But what we're saying is society needs to wake up and look at the implications of the situation we're in at present, particularly for women. Um, very often there's no choice. So how do you create some choice? You create choice by building the services around childcare. I mean, this debate around care reminds me very much of how we started off discussing childcare. You know, people say, do we need childcare? You know, women are doing it. And then we built up our childcare services in the community. Uh, we had part-time, we had full-time, we have some private, some public, we have a mix, we've set standards, we've tried to improve the work, uh, you know, the work uh, standards for those uh, who are working in childcare. Still a long way to go. So the, this is a long journey. It's been a long journey in childcare and it's continuing. Now, when you look at care issues around the elderly, for example, it's the very same. It's, it's, a, it's a whole of life continuum. And what we're saying is there is a greater role, both for the European Commission, by doing exactly what Colin has said, 
for the member states by developing services. So you might, for example, uh, when you look at women, if women have the choice to move in and out of care roles, if that's what they choose, or if they want to bring in public services to support the care responsibilities they have at home or that are needed at home, that's going to be a help. You could also look, for example, as some countries have, and Dennis mentioned some of this, you could look at um, giving some credits for care mm -hmm. that's carried out in the home, that when you return to the workforce, you're not at such a disadvantage then in, in terms of eligibility for pensions. So we know you have this appalling pension gap, we have a pay gap, but an even worse pension gap uh, across the European Union, up to 40%. I mean, it's extraordinary. It means women's older lives can be spent in poverty. So there's advantages for everybody. Perhaps we should look at more permits uh, in our uh, immigration policies um, if for people who are doing care and care responsibilities. Build up more skills training for care workers. There's a lot of money in the Just Transition Fund. There is money in the uh, Resilience uh, Fund as well and the EU Guarantee Scheme. Why not put some of that money that's going to be there for training, let's put it there to support our care workers. Mm -hmm. And they will feel less isolated. Many of them have moved between countries. It can be very isolating working in a, a private okay. home. All of those things would make a difference. Okay, thank you for that. We, we'll come back to maybe tease that out a little bit more, but just sticking on the point of proper remuneration. Um, if I can go to you, Stacey, um, how can European societies ensure that carers, A, are properly paid for the work they're doing in their care jobs, mm -hmm. and then for those who are not paid at all, like those who volunteer in the home, how can you make sure they're properly paid for that work that they do? Well, again, uh, what we'd like to see in the strategy is, uh, coming back to my earlier points, is, is, is a tool to rebalance responsibilities between professional and informal mm -hmm. carers. At the moment, most member states tend to over-rely um, or rely excessively on informal carers. Those carers will not disappear altogether. We need them. Their contribution is essential, but um, um, informal care should not be a barrier to uh, a good professional, professional sorry, and social life. So that's the strategy should focus on, what the strategy should focus on. So maybe to repeat some of the points that were made earlier, yes, we definitely need indicators in the field of long-term care, as well as targets in terms of uh, access to long-term care, a bit along the lines of what we have uh, in the field of childcare with the Barcelona targets. We also need, I think, to define a quality framework for uh, long-term care, which should be rooted in human rights and focused on, on people's so care users and their carers' preferences, dignity, and quality of life. Uh, because at the end of the day, quality in care is not only about inputs and uh, process compliance, it should be about better outcomes for care users. Uh, we probably also need to pay specific attention to social care, which uh, from our perspective and in light of the, the, the crisis we're going through, uh, is sometimes seen, uh, it seems, by some policymakers as non-essential uh, compared to healthcare. So it's been disregarded, and that should change. And that's only for professional care. For informal carers, you know, I think the, the, the first step in addressing an issue is to recognize uh, we have one. And so I think it's high time we developed a, a legal status for informal carers in Europe which would give them access to rights and obligations. So some of the rights have been mentioned by Mrs. Fitzgerald in terms of uh, access to pension, for example, social protection, but also access to information and training, validation of skills, if it can help them to return to the labor market, respite care. There's a long list which we um, detailed in our own strategy published in 2018. Um, another important issue or in important challenge we're facing um, at, U at European level is the lack of good quality data and comparable data in, in terms of care and caring. Uh, again, the, uh, the EU has a strong role to play there to collect and to encourage member states to, uh, to define uh, good quality indicators. I know that the Commission and the Social Protection Committee are working um, actively on the development of indicators in the field of long-term care, focusing on access, quality and sustainability. Uh, we hope this can be the starting point for a reflection process on targets. And yes, and absolutely, funds should also be allocated to investment in social protection and in care and caring. 
And just very quickly, uh, Stacey, say, for example, then, that, you know, th that, that the whole area of informal caring becomes more formalized and there's a better structure for those who care. Will that not inevitably then have a knock-on effect in terms of the costs of those services? Because they are presumably going to charge more and this may in, in then have the effect of increasing the costs of care. Well, actually, what we're seeing is that in those countries where there's uh, a combination of uh, access to good quality care and universal care plus good support measures available to carers, well, actually, people tend to prefer uh, professional care, you know. So this idea that if we formalize somehow informal care, people will, you know, will stay at home and will not be productive and, and uh, yeah, and will become informal carers and, and get wages for that, uh, you know, I think, I think um, you know, is not correct. Um, I think experience demonstrates uh, the exact opposite. And um, yeah, I think formalizing, if formalizing means, you know, giving again a legal status and rights and obligations, um, it's exactly the same thing as being a parent. I have three kids, I have rights and obligations as a parent. I don't feel like I'm part of the formal childcare workforce. <laughs> and yet I'm part of the system <laughs> somehow. So why um, can't we apply the same philosophy to long-term care? Okay, very good. Um, Dennis, I want to go to you because yeah. we have a couple of questions that have come in actually from our uh, viewers online. So this one for you, what do you see as the role of trade unions? After all, collective bargaining coverage is abysmally low and wages remain often lower than 60% of the national median. Maybe if you could take that question first, please. Yeah, uh, of course I, I can. Thank you for the question. It's, uh, uh, it's a bit, bit funny that it is pointed directly to me because uh, I'm the uh, Parliament's rapporteur or co-rapporteur uh, on the directive of, of minimum wages and I've worked uh, for many years uh, for, for a trade union in Germany. Uh, so of course, and with, with concrete view on the, on the care sector, we had a, a fundamental change now in, in, in Germany because we, we had a lack of uh, uh, collective uh, agreements in the in the care sector. Only 12 percent of the the carers, the formal carers in Germany, were under uh, the protection of a collective agreement. And so we changed the law and said uh, uh, formal care can only be paid uh, if the if the company is uh, uh, is paying the the carers uh, um, uh, with a with a collective agreement. So uh, of course this is very important. I think the question of uh, uh, of payment in the uh, in the care sector is important, uh, uh, but uh, would, uh, maybe I'm I'm allowed to pick one point up. Uh, there was a mentioning of dignity, and this is at the very center of Christian democracy and EPP, uh, because it is about the dignity of uh, of of uh, uh, caretakers, but it is also uh, about the dignity. Of the the people who are doing the work, and this should be in the in the in the center of the of, of, of our debate and our decision. And please allow me one one last remark. I find it uh, very good what uh, what what Francis was um, saying about uh, we have to to uh, to uh, create uh, things around people. And please uh, allow me to give one example. My father is 70 years old. When he was a little boy, there was no opportunity for my grandmother uh, to, to give him to a kindergarten. When I was a little boy, I'm 42 now, uh, there was an opportunity to go to kindergarten from 8 to 12 o'clock. Uh, and now we have opportunities, you, 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 uh, I, I say nearly around the clock. Uh, and that gives uh, 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 parents a freedom of choice. And I think we, we, we have to achieve the same freedom of choice in elderly care uh, like we, we have it now in, uh, uh, in, the, in the child care. And I think it is possible. In, in Germany, we have also a mix of systems of formal and informal care. And uh, I, I think it is possible that we achieve it European-wide. Okay, thank you for that. Colin, if I can go back to you, maybe first of all, just a response on, on what has been said so far. Maybe you want to pick up on some of the points, but also there's a question specifically that came in for, uh, for you from our online audience, and it is, what can the EU do to support the development and sustainability of care services, which are very local? 
Um, well, first of all, um, I, I, I'm, I'm very in, actually I'm encouraged by, by what I hear from from all the all the speakers because I think we have we have very very similar objectives and uh, and that all goes well for the work that we uh, we, we have to do to do ahead. Um, and I, I particularly appreciate the uh, you know what what the other speakers have been saying, um, focusing on the on on dignity, focusing on on choice. These are all aspects that, that are extremely important, I think, to our approach and which we will be looking to develop uh, even further. Um, now, as uh, you, you asked the question about whether, you know, what, what we can do on, on the more local level. And, and I think this is also one of the aspects that we have been trying to introduce into our approach, that first of all, many of these issues that we're talking about are, um, are national competence. There isn't, it isn't an, an EU competence as such. But in fact, uh, even more than, than national, very often it is, it is a local uh, competence or it is a local service that is, that is being office, offered or which is lacking. Um, so it's very important that we work with, uh, with administrations at all levels of government. Um, it's important that, we, uh, that, that when we're looking at the European level, we, we also look at the situation on the local level, learn the lessons um, at the local level. Um, I think uh, it was mentioned by, by, by all of the speakers, the importance of looking at the evidence, looking at the data, um, what has been happening and what, uh, you know, what experiences we have. Um, we shouldn't just be coming up with policies that sound good, but we have to base those policies on, on, uh, on, on very solid and concrete basis. And it's only by talking to, to all the different levels of government that we can hope to achieve that. Okay, um, maybe Francis Fitzgerald, I'll go back to you because you talked about childcare already. It's come up several times. <coughs> Um, and we know that working from home is, an, is not a substitute um, for childcare. But what are people demanding now and, and how can those demands be met? Well, I, I think we've learned a lot during COVID about, you know, hybrid working. <laughs> and uh, let's try and continue to learn the lessons. Uh, let's not throw them all out post-COVID, although COVID is still obviously an ongoing issue. Um, we've learned about flexibility. We've learned about employers' uh, flexibility and the need for it. Employers have learned they get a very good service from people, uh, from workers who are working from home. Uh, there are advantages. Um, probably most people will opt for, you know, a, a sort of a mixture of working from home, going into the office, certainly in the immediate future. So I think the key demand around childcare is going to be accessibility and affordability and flexibility. It's going to be about flexibility. Um, you might have a, a young couple with a young children who, um, you know, want certain days, want afternoons, want mornings, etc. We need that kind of flexibility. We probably need to have local hubs. We're talking about local in rural areas. I think there's a real opportunity now to have uh, workplace facilities and childcare facilities in the same place in these local hubs. Again, this is something that governments could provide money for um, through the various funds that have come from the EU, could be part of the criteria to develop these kind of services. Um, and, you know, the, there's a lot the EU can do at a standard setting level, I think. So childcare is incredibly important. Countries vary enormously. We have the Nordic models. Then we have other countries where parents have to pay quite a bit. We have some countries where childcare is subsidized, most countries, in fact. So we need to continue to deliver those services. And as I've said already, Karen, those services have the same needs to, uh, you know, increase pay, better standards, uniformity, regulation. All that's really important because the quality of care you give to the child, the quality of care you give to the older person, for example, in a residential setting. I mean, we really saw some problems during the pandemic in relation to some residential settings. You know, we've got to really improve the standards. We've seen amazing residential services, but we've, we've also seen some where, you know, that leave a lot to be desired. And we've had some, you know, high death rates as well. Um, at the beginning of COVID, perhaps people did not understand the seriousness and how easily COVID could be passed on and so on. But look, I, I think this is all about deciding that this is a central policy issue for national governments and for the EU, for the Commission. It is central to people's lives. Let's not pretend it's something that can be done in a totally informal way. It's just not good enough in modern society. And I'll finish by saying okay. I think it's about rediscovering community as well. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let's go back to you, Stacey, because uh, Francis mentioned there the issue about some of the care homes and, of course, the elderly in particular being vulnerable to COVID. 
But for, for older people, more vulnerable people, if they want, if their choice is to get care at home, they want to be at home, they don't want to go into nursing homes or residential um, homes, what can the EU do? So what can be done at an EU level to ensure the best kind of care is given to them, both in terms of the carers that are working for them and helping them and the funds to be able to pay for that care as well? Thank you. Well, first of all, it is very clear, again, from our perspective, that uh, the lack of adequate, good quality, community-based care options is one of the key drivers in terms of the challenges we face regarding quality, sustainability and unmet needs. Um, the lack of alternative solutions also partly explains the high prevalence of informal care in Europe. Um, so we really need to boost developments there and the, the, the EU can do a lot in terms of investing EU funds, supporting member states, encouraging them to invest uh, where adequate, exchanging good practices, collecting good practices and exchanging them, exchanging them sorry, collecting uh, again good quality data and, and setting targets. Um, so, you know, those challenges are common to all member states. Um, and, and people move around. You will have people from the Nordic countries will go and retire in, 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 in Southern Europe, for example. So we need to have a coordinated approach there. It doesn't mean we have to apply the exact same solutions in all member states, but we at least need to have the, the same targets. Okay, um, Colin, if I can go back to you, these are very, very big challenges um, to really be able to you know, roll out, encourage uh, excellent care in all the member states. Do you think that's really achievable? Well, I think, I actually think it is because um, I think there is agreement on the fact that this is something we, we desperately need to look at. And, this is, and there was this feeling already before COVID, but I think COVID just really shone the light on, on how, how difficult the situation is and, and how much the, the whole sector needs to be uh, needs to be looked at in a in a new way, um, but but I think we need to we need to be very clear about what the objectives are and about what the tools at our disposal are to be able to achieve them, and that everyone needs to play their own part because the competences are different, the competences are shared, um, and and everyone has a has a role to play. Now I think that um, uh, many of these aspects have already been mentioned. If we take, for instance, the the, the the, you know, the lessons learned. We, we look at the different experiences that we've had in different member space, the states. Some of them can be applied um, to, to other systems, others perhaps a bit more are a bit more difficult to, to apply so, so, so easily. But it's very important and very useful not only to talk about um, solutions or policies in the abstract, where we have examples that can be, that can be shown, uh, you know, we can see how they've actually worked in practice, that's obviously going to be much easier to apply and and uh, and to implement. And and as was mentioned, we don't need to have a fully uniform approach across the board. Um, the important thing is that the end product is one that is that is both sustainable, but also is something that is deserving of the uh, of the dignity of the of the people who uh, who need this level of care. And in the strategy, will thinking be given? to funds and how they could potentially be used in care? Well, um, as has been mentioned, a lot of this is in member state competence. So, so obviously it is up to member states how they spend their own budgets. We will be looking at, at our, own, um, our own funding and seeing what, uh, what could be proposed in this, in this regard. But I think one of the most important aspects is that um, even in using EU funds, member states have a degree of discretion in, in how this is in how this is implemented within their own country. So what th the best we can do is encourage them to prioritize care when they are um, uh, when they are de deploying um, uh, EU funding. And, and that, I think that you know we have we have many opportunities which other speakers have have already referred to. But I think it's it goes beyond beyond only funding. We also have to, uh, and, and funding of the care itself directly, there are also other things which are ancillary to this, which we need to be looking at. For example, innovation, technology. There are a number of things that can be done in that, in that area, which can facilitate care or which can provide the support to care and, uh, and where, where not enough is being done at this, uh, at this stage. In some member states, in, I can mention Finland, for example, where I'm familiar with some of the work that has been done over there, uh, technology is used to a far larger degree than it is in many other 
member states. So there are lessons to be learned there. Okay, um, Dennis, maybe I can um, ask you for your comments on that. Indeed, the rollout of technologies, the likes of digital health, um, how can they be better harnessed for those who are providing care and receiving it? And also maybe your views on how EU funds could be harnessed to deliver services and improve infrastructures in EU countries. Well, I think uh, there's a lot of potential for uh, dig digitalization uh, in, the, in the care sector, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, uh, and, and I, I do not want to be misunderstood. So uh, I think a, a, a robot uh, uh, can, can, can never re replace a, a, a real human being in the, in the care sector, but, but it can help in, in, uh, in assisting and, and doing some things and uh, give the, the caregiver uh, the freedom to do other things in, in, instead. So I think there is a there is a lot of uh, of potential. And uh, with view on the on the funding, I think there are a lot of uh, there is a lot of EU funding uh, left and right here and there. Uh, and, and we have ES, uh, ESF plus. We have uh, EU for health and and several other funds. But I think it is necessary when we are talking about how to structure it in the future. Uh, how can we find synergies b b b b between all that funds and uh, uh, yeah m make it a bit more more the, the approach a bit more clearer and maybe one last remark I think it, for the future it is important um, that we have a, a, a separate uh, a view on on the one thing not only when we are talking about money for social affairs it's not only about transferring money to people uh, 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 we, we have we have to split what is uh, transferring money directly to people and what is a social investment we we uh, we, we have talked here about uh, uh, how, how can we help in in creating infrastructure uh, and so on and this is not uh, transferring directly money uh, to people so because the European Union is not responsible for uh, for giving the the, the people the pension or, or, or whatever uh, but we, we can help in building up uh, uh, social infrastructure and uh, so I think we, we, we should uh, have a, a different view on that okay and very quickly because we just have a few minutes left Dennis if I can go back to you as well yeah. what are the next steps then for the EPP group in terms of securing the delivery of the European care strategy well, uh, for, for the moment, I think it is a, a, um, a big success for, for our political family that it is so, so big on the uh, Commission's agenda now. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, gave a clear statement in her uh, state uh, state of the union it is in the work program of the uh, european commission for for next year and as a epp group we will uh, we will keep pushing it and uh, i'm i'm pretty sure uh, w when it comes to to legislation it will be an epp rapporteur uh, uh, who who is, is is pushing it forward and forward and forward Okay, um, Dennis, thank you for that. And Francis Fitzgerald, if I can just go back to you for a final few comments, really. And, and really, having listened to some of the proposals and the answers to some of the questions, what, what are the takeaways from your point of view from the discussion? Well, I'm very optimistic, actually, uh, because the Commission has taken this on as part of its work programme. There's huge commitment here in the Parliament. Um, my takeaways are that we cannot leave carers or those who, uh, you know, uh, the people who are being cared or those uh, being, be, be, who are doing the caring. We cannot leave them isolated. And instead of talking about the cost of it, perhaps sometimes we should talk about the cost of not doing it. Yes. The price that individuals pay uh, from the point of view of health. Our health services um, have to, uh, very often, uh, they end up really giving the services anyway. You could prevent a lot of hospitalizations, a lot of residential care, if we really do the work that's needed on this European care strategy. So I think the time is ripe, as I said at the beginning. I think there's lots of good ideas about, <coughs> Colin talked about best practice from different countries. Using technology, yes, I've seen some great examples of that around the world. Indeed, I've seen it in Japan, I've seen it in Ireland. I I think we can gather together a lot of best practice models and really start giving l more leadership on this care issue because leadership is needed nationally and at a European level. 
Okay, we'll leave it there, but thank you very much to Francis Fitzgerald, Dennis Rodka, Colin Shikluna, and Stessy Ige Monas. Thank you so much for your time and giving us your views, sharing your opinions with us. Thanks to, to all of you who sent in very valuable uh, questions. It was great to hear from you, and thanks very much to the team and to the technical people who put uh, today's seminar together for us. It's been a pleasure to be with you today and I will sign off and hope to see you again. Thank you. Goodbye now.